Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Mr. Joseph R. Lee, who is a Jungian analyst in private practice in Southern Virginia. He is co-host and co-creator of This Jungian Life podcast, as well as the online learning program Dream School, where people learn how to interpret their own dreams. He is president emeritus of the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts that provides analytic training. And we will have links in the show notes to these uh, online resources and information about Joseph. Joseph Lee, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Hey, John, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Likewise, uh, we have been in communication for some time, and I have really been looking forward to this discussion as well. And as just a, a preamble to our audience here, I came across Joseph and his colleagues on this Jungian Life podcast a couple of months ago. I was interested, I, I had an idea, I'm curious about, you know, archetypes and how archetypes might be able to be used in a national security or even marketing context. And so the, you guys have had a really interesting episode and in, link in the show notes again called The Archetype of War. A uh, really interesting conversation. But my thought, so the, the conversation that I want to have with you today, Joseph, will kind of swirl around the idea of being able to model empirically archetypes, to be able to understand archetypes uh, using data science, and then being able to apply those archetypal models for various different national security, or maybe even, like I said, commercial marketing uh, purposes. So I'm thinking archetypes of individuals, archetypes of teams of people, archetypes of cultures and societies. And I guess I just wanna generally uh, explore that kind of a discussion space. Uh, does that sound okay? I think it's really interesting. And I also think that any field that is interested in what is typical about a culture or an individual is already pressing into the realm of archetypes, even if they're not using that language. Mm. Right, so, right. Like in, in, in uh, you know, for corporations uh, looking to market to current and prospective customers, I, I know that marketing teams come up with, with uh, customer avatars, which is a general description of their ideal customer for a particular product, who, you know, what they tend to like, you know, what online areas they tend to inhabit, you know, a whole bunch of different, you know, perspectives on their ideal uh, customer. And that's probably getting into the space as well. I think that's a tremendous <laughs> idea. The idea of the customer avatar, that there is a prototypical person that, we can run as a, a kind of model, even an, even a, a create an algorithm around it, which is really happening right now, for instance, in social media, that people can collect enough information in these large corporations, create artificial models and predict what you'd be interested in and what you would click on. And that's all in the realm of archetypes. Oh, yeah, well, fantastic. So all of that. Uh, so maybe we could, do a little bit of level setting here at the beginning. So uh, some in our audience may be familiar, uh, may not be familiar with, with Jung and archetypes. And me for one, as I was growing up, uh, I always heard Jung and Freud mentioned 
simultaneously, just like that. You know, oh, well, there's Jung and Freud and then Jung and Freud this and Jung and Freud that. And I, I didn't think that they were the same person, but I always thought that they were very similar. And uh, anyway, the, could, could you maybe just give like a quick little compare and contrast of, of who Jung was and who, who Freud was and what they were all about? Well, Freud brought the idea of the unconscious and working with the unconscious as a therapeutic tool into the modern era. He was really a scientist. He wasn't a, psych, a psychiatrist. There really was no such thing as a, a psychotherapist per se. He was, I believe, a, a neurologist, um, if I'm remembering that correctly. And he was working with clients who were coming to him with strange neurologic problems like uh, sudden blindness or the inability to mobilize your right arm. And as he was examining people, he could not find any physiologic reason that their functioning would be so disrupted. So as he began to get a life history, as he began to work with these people, he began to suspect that there was something going on psychologically that was causing these symptoms. And out of these investigations, he developed an entire theory that there was unconscious information that was so threatening to the conscious life of the individual that the locking down of the secret was also interrupting the functioning of their bodies. And he believed that if one could uncover the secret and bring that to life, and that the individual would have a concurrent emotional release, which we call catharsis, and that actually comes from uh, the Greek plays, that they actually could be relieved of the symptoms. And in fact, he could demonstrate that with people. Before him, the psychiatrists, for instance, in France, were very, very active. They were working a lot with hypnosis, strangely enough, as a way of trying to get to the hidden part of the personality. But Freud really discovered that dialogue could be adequate. Jung was one of many talented uh, scientists who decided that they were also interested to know about psychoanalysis. Jung trained with Freud and developed a powerful friendship. Based on what little we know, Freud thought that Jung was going to be his heir apparent, was going to take his theory and continue to move it forward. Freud was a good bit older than Jung, and Jung had a kind of Western European appeal. So in the beginning, Jung was smitten with the application and the relevance of Freud's work. But over time, Jung began to feel that there were limits in Freud's work and in a gesture that's hard for us to understand, he decided that he was going to publish a very thorough and in some ways excoriating criticism of Freud's work, which was um, embarrassing to Freud mm. and created uh, this it, enormous it, conflict. Right, and, and, and so uh, Freud was still alive at this point? This, this was known to him? Very much so. Ah. Is, from, is mm -hmm. this like a, a a point of like schism or something? Is this like well well known like uh, separation of these two ideologies or schools of thought or something? It was, it absolutely was, and Freud's crew um, took great offense at what they thought was a betrayal on Jung's side. But what it came down to is that Freud felt that the life force that was getting locked up in people was inherently related to sex. And his entire theory was about the evolution of sexual energy in the child and then into adulthood. And that th anything that thwarted that created later psychological problems. Jung didn't disagree with that. He just said that wasn't the only thing that was happening. He said that there were many different shades and gradations of life force or psychological energy, and not all of them circled around sexual satisfaction. So that was one enormous rift, because for Freud, 
the sexual theory was the center of his contribution. As Jung continued to separate from Freud, he then also began to expand and talk about the collective unconscious. Mm. And this, for Freud, began to abut on the realm of mysticism. And as a scientist, Freud just rejected that and accused Jung of being crazy. And at that point, the war was really on between the two I of see. them. I see. So yeah, th that that also comports with uh, yeah my like rough understanding of these two uh, gentlemen is that Freud tends to be more accepted as uh, a, a scientist, and Jung less so. And there, yeah. You know, so you can you can go down that rabbit hole uh, a, a long ways and separate out people who uh, who who tend to believe one thing or another. But that that's a great intro. And I think you started touching on why uh, archetypes tend to be associated with Jung, in that um, uh, Jung Jung's outlook is broader than sex and uh, uh, starts getting into collective consciousness type notion. So maybe we can go on to our next level set type of a question. And so could, could you give us a, a 101 on like what archetypes are and, uh, and then we'll go on from there. Sure. So Jung described archetypes in different ways across his career and across his writings. One of the things that Jung is criticized for and simultaneously lauded for is that when he would publish, it was reflective of a particular position he held at that time. And then several years later, he may come back and revisit the idea and take an entirely new approach because he was evolving in his understanding. Mm. So. On one level, archetypes are something that are inherent and germane to most human beings. In the simplest way, human brains are designed to recognize typicality. So if you're here in the United States and you learn about flowers, let's say, and your brain recognizes without you having to tell it that there are some typical qualities that flowers exhibit. If you then wound up on the other side of the planet, let's say you're suddenly in Australia or Indonesia, you would still be able to scan the natural environment and recognize what flowers were, even if you'd never seen one in that shape or color, but you'd still know that there was something typical about a flower. So Jung took that recognition, which I think is widely known now, and began to question, what are the psychological structures that existed prior to the development of an individual consciousness that seemed to shape these typicalities? He didn't think it was just based on humans exposure to certain things, but that there was something even before one is exposed to a flower, let's say, that there is a latent pattern of recognition somewhere in the psyche. And at that time, MRIs didn't exist, CT scans didn't exist, mapping a genome didn't exist. So Jung was left with a kind of philosophic curiosity. And I think much more has been advanced since then. So as he began to look at typicalities in the dreams of his clients and the stories they were telling and his access to anthropology and archaeologic information, which there was a great swell of here in 1920, 30, 40. An enormous amount of information was being brought into Europe from uh, the um, Far East and the Near East. He began to notice that in these newly translated mythologic and religious texts, that things were being described, which he was hearing in the dreams of his clients. So it's a famous story, if uh, I can uh, yeah. take a bit of time to it. Yeah. Jung is working in the Berkholsley Psychiatric Hospital. And psychiatric hospitals back then were very different. The psychiatrists lived on site with their families 
They had a tremendous amount of integration with the patients who often even helped run the hospital as well as gardening, as well as other tasks. And he came to know a particular patient and he walked over to the patient one day as they were staring outside of the window. And his name was uh, Emily, I believe. And he's looking at the sun and he says, there is a hose that's dropping out of the sun and this air is blowing out of it. And so Jung kind of shrugged his shoulders, we could imagine and wrote that in the notes and didn't think twice about it. Later that week, he had ordered the translation of an ancient papyrus and it just arrived. And this is something that had only recently been described. And in the papyrus, there are mythologic stories of the sun's phallus. And out of the sun's phallus, all the wind of the world originated. Mm. And Jung was shocked. There, there was absolutely no way that this Swiss peasant who, who had barely any education could have possibly been exposed to this newly uncovered Egyptian mythology. And yet mm -hmm. his client was tuning into something, though he was psychotic at the moment, that was universal across time. And that invigorated his curiosity about these certain kinds of patterns that human beings can have access to. Yeah, so, yeah, that um, is, uh, that's interesting stuff. And it reminds me of my initial interest in these kinds of topics. Uh, back, uh, this is this is 20 years ago, at least, I happened upon this series and I, I've actually mentioned this before on a previous episode, but uh, this uh, PBS series with a fellow named Joseph Campbell, it was called The Power of Myth. And I think he actually has a book that's called The Power of Myth, or it's The, the Hero with a Thousand Faces or The Hero's Journey. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the, in the show notes. But this was like a, a six-part PBS series with Bill Moyers, where they were talking all about this kind of stuff. And what struck me and just really hooked me in was exactly the kinds of things that you've been talking about, Joseph. It's these, they're, they're uh, you know, through uh, uh, discoveries made and translations made in the late 1800s and early 1900s, mid 1900s about civilizations, uh, disparate civilizations all across the world, there tend to be some common themes or myths and stories which are really similar, uh, but these were people, peoples, civilizations that had no contact with one another. Similar stories in the, you know, in South America and Central America compared to those stories in, in the Far East, like uh, stories of the flood or a, a flood and, you know, those types of themes. And I think that that starts getting towards uh, the types of things that, that Jung was, was synthesizing. Would you say that's about right? Yeah, I think that uh, Campbell was initially influenced by Jung's prioritization of the hero mythology. And then that inspired him to do a very rigorous analysis of that writing the hero with a thousand faces he already had earned, I think, a master's degree in Arthurian studies and had a literary background. He also had some extraordinary experiences talking about Campbell. Then when he was traveling with his family to India, he befriended a Krishnamurti who uh, became a substantial mystical figure in uh, the theosophical world and in India and a very, very particularly erudite fellow. So he was leaning into these really extraordinary relationships and was particularly interested in European mythology initially, Krishnamurti introduced him into this kind of Indian philosophy. So Campbell, much like Jung, was noticing in these literary revelations that certain patterns seemed to unfold. And when he published that in the Hero with a Thousand Faces, being able to recognize 
these patterns that were repeated over and over again, it, it was kind of a, a revolution of thinking. And one of the people who was highly inspired by Campbell's work was uh, George Lucas, who wrote mm -hmm. the Star Wars mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. material and really looked very carefully at um, Campbell's work and reproduced these stages through the Star Wars uh, trilogies. And the material was wildly successful. And for all of us who've seen uh, Star Wars, and I remember seeing the first episode uh, in Star Wars and just was knocked out of my seat. I was a kid in high school. But the movie itself and Lucas's writing are not really great. Like the, the dialogue that Lucas writes is like famously terrible, but there was still something in the sequencing of the story that human beings found irresistible. And that speaks to the archetypal power that when we see something that's archetypal, something lights up in our psychology that makes it compelling almost on a religious level. Right. Yeah, I know exactly what you're you're talking about with the the Star Wars uh, stories and the hero's journey. So I, uh, my rough recollection of what the hero's journey is, is something like you've got a person and the person is immature or the person has a set of problems or uh, the but but the hero the this person goes off on an adventure and the adventure could be uh, something that the per person chooses, but maybe more often than not, it's, it's an adventure that gets thrust upon this person, but the person's life circumstances are just so that this is the right thing at the right time. And you, you go off into, into the abyss, into the unknown. And in the star Wars stories, this is like, the uh, the uh, bar scene, right, where you're you're on this frontier where there's all these weird animals, there's these weird things happening. Uh, it's very confusing, and anyway, this this story unfolds, and like you said, it it resonates so much because it has this structure that is somehow, you know, uh, buried in each of us, and so it it just has this amazing um, uh, effect on an audience. Absolutely. I think Campbell's um, archetypal heroic story is divided often into three parts. The separation or departure from the old life, the initiation, and then the return. And they identified many uh, subcategories of all of that. So we remember that scene in Star Wars where uh, the little robot, what is it, R2-D2, uh, comes yeah. forward uh -huh. and then he shows this movie of Princess Leia crying out in distress and, and needing help. And all of a sudden, you know, Luke is captured by this impulse to rescue, to get involved. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. At first, he actually pushes back on it. He's too frightened to move forward. And he locks up, which Campbell talks about as the first refusal of the call. Then the stormtroopers show up and annihilate members of his family. And then that's the second time he realizes, I can't resist the call. I've got to go on this journey. So that pattern of receiving the call, refusing, hearing it a second time, and then actually taking the journey that will change you and change you in a way that when you return, you are not the same. Mm -hmm. There's also that wonderful moment in Lord of the Rings where the hobbits all come back to Hobbiton and they're quietly sitting in uh, one of the pubs and they're staring at each other like Vietnam vets, staring at each other quietly while all of this laughter and wildness and normal culture is going on around them. And they realize that they are different now. They cannot simply slide back into the old story, the old narrative, that they are marked by what has happened to them and that they will either become leaders in that community. And for Frodo, he still has to leave. He's so at odds with that world that he no longer fits. Yeah. And 
I think he, you know, so most people don't have a uh, space adventure as part of their lived experience or some kind of <laughs> fanciful, uh, literally dragon slaying adventure. That's not literally what people's lives are like, or at least not until today where you have, have virtual <laughs> reality headsets and stuff like that. Let's set that aside for the moment. Yeah, but, you sure. know, pe people's lived lives are not you know, these types of, you know, dragon slaying, uh, uh, fantasy adventures, these, these stories. Uh, but, uh, I, I think Campbell goes on to say that's, that's kind of what the purpose of, of rituals are and, of maybe of institutions. And so you have, um, uh, religions that have their rituals, which, uh, attempt to, provide these same types of experiences, but maybe in, in a more symbolic way, uh, maybe in literal ways, but not, uh, not like, you know, going off and, and, and killing people necessarily. So you have like in uh, Christianity, like a, the a ritual of communion, or even just the ritual of going to a church or synagogue or mosque, you know, there's 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 a transformation that happens when you step through that doorway and you enter enter that experience and the you know clergy and and various different people who are uh, affiliated with the uh, church have a role to try to anyway do do you think all of that uh, makes sense? Uh, absolutely. And uh, if I can ask you a question, you're a marine, right? Or you you came out of the uh, marines. That that was, uh, I would imagine, a profoundly initiatic process. Yeah, you yeah, heard for, for sure. Yeah, or yeah, some for kind sure. Of a That's call. very, very much a, a a visceral before and after type experience. So, you know, Marines uh, go to boot camp, and I, I can. You know that's that's like a very mysterious, otherworldly type of a transformation, and then, uh, you yeah, know, the enlisted Marines go through what's called uh, the crucible, which is a trial, and on the other side of the crucible, that's where they earn the title Marine, and so yeah, that is very much so the, the same kind of a transformational, um, uh, ritualistic experience, I suppose. I, I think so very much. And it speaks to the bonding also that you have afterwards, that you have left the ordinary life. And for Jung, you've left the life of the mother and the home and separated from that kind of coddling or having an adult meet your needs and then being thrust into the world where you have to fight to achieve that you have to discover your muscularity to achieve is something that human beings crave. And if the culture doesn't provide it, they will try to manufacture it. And this is one of the theories around gang violence and the rise of gangs all across the globe for that matter. There's a really interesting guy named Kwame Scruggs who is doing work with inner city youth and he's introducing myths of initiation to um, young inner city fellows and trying to guide them through a kind of mythic journey so they don't have to enact it unconsciously in the neighborhood through a kind of crude gang style initiation. And it's incredibly effective. So we seek these things out, even these um, heartbreaking stories of uh, fraternities uh, accidentally causing alcohol poisoning in one of the initiates, because the impulse to put them through the crucible shows up as, you know, drinking a liter of vodka. The impulse, the archetype to want to expose a young man to something that will challenge him, maybe bring him right to the edge of something. And then he returns from the edge different and then joins the crew of the initiated. That impulse is valid because it's an unconscious impulse and it doesn't have enough language around it. It shows up sometimes in ways that are highly dangerous. Right. Um, I think I waylaid us just a little bit uh, and we might have gotten off track on uh, archetypes, but could, could we circle back? Are, are there... <sighs> Are there a handful 
or more of archetypes that are relatively well defined or or understood or accepted in the community of Jungian analysts? Do they have names and, and descriptions? He does. If you go through the collected works, Jung tends to gravitate towards uh, a handful of archetypes. But I think there are organizations that have tried to extend that. Um, that off the top of my head, I can't quite pull back some of those names. But for Jung, the idea of the anima, which is the internal feminine, the animus, the internal masculine, the self, which is often the religious image, the great mother, the great father, the shadow, the persona, the wise person, and the youth, the maiden or the uninitiated boy. So those are a handful of archetypal patterns that seemed to show up over and over again in people's mm. dreams mm. and also universally in mythology. Yeah, so uh, that was helpful. Um, I can't recap all of them, <laughs> uh, but uh, so so do the, let's just say the Greek and Roman gods, is there a relatively well-known god for each one of those um, archetypes that you just mentioned? Or, or maybe there's several gods that tend to inhabit uh, those, those archetypes typically. Um, could, you, could you maybe map a couple of those for us? Sure. So one of the places that I think these archetypes show up again are in movies, sometimes very subtly, sometimes very directly. I think the current interest in the Marvel comic movies is super interesting because the supernatural component of these people is, um, is at the forefront. They're not ordinary heroes, they're extraordinary. So for instance, Captain America I think relative to uh, your audience and uh, and yeah. the informational professionals that come out of the military is a central character. And he could represent the archetypal hero, that he's a kind of ordinary boy that winds up getting transformed in such a way that then he carries in a supernatural way, the heightened virtuous values of American culture. The difference between the ancient gods and the modern god images that show up in the Marvel comics, comics is that science has intruded upon mythology. So Captain America was exposed to a certain kind of substance as they were trying to create kind of a mm -hmm. super warrior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So science bestowed this rather than some supernatural dynamic right they all have some kind of an origin story that that is tangible i guess right that that also is reflective of the current culture so spider-man has to get bitten by a radioactive spider so that has to happen or uh, steve banner is exposed to some kind of radioactive substance and he becomes the hulk which was also happening around the time of the cold war so people were as a culture afraid of things like nuclear weapons so then it comes into the mythology so yeah, Captain America, and, and, yeah. and con contrasting that with what you know my my recollections about you know greek mythology is that oh i don't know if, uh you know some of the gods are like born of Zeus or, you know, was like a, a, a chunk out of Zeus's side becomes one of the, one of the lesser gods, but it, it was more like the, the gods were mating with one another or were, were spun off from other gods. Whereas uh, today it's, it, it's a, well, I, I guess they're, they're stories that, that people can relate to in some way more uh, to, to, to make the, to make the uh, characters more, well, relatable. Credible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That for us, science has become magical. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, it's still magical. I could not fully explain to you how my television works. I mean, we, we accept that it's engineered by scientists and we're all kind of satisfied by it. 
but a lot of us knuckleheads, myself included, just kind of turn it on and magical things show up on it and I just roll with it. But science has replaced magic. Yeah, I I don't know who this is attributed to, but I've heard uh, several times people say that uh, technology, uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So if if we could somehow morph back in time a couple of hundred years and show somebody our iPhones, it would just absolutely rock their world. It would be magic. I mean, we, we know it's not magic, but like you said, very few people can actually explain how the stuff works. But, you know, right. yeah. But we don't attribute it to the gods. We attribute it to scientists who, in a sense, have become something like gods <laughs> in our culture. And when we think about the technology of CRISPR, where you can actually redesign a human being by nipping certain bits of data out of their genome, that, <laughs> that is Promethean in its power. That is a, an extraordinary godlike ability. Yeah, um, for sure. I would have an episode on on that technology. Uh, I because I, I don't fully understand it, but yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I've I've heard someone mention that you can literally create anything uh, by manipulating the DNA and what we what has been created in the past, like all of the extinct animals, all the extinct species and everything that exists today is just a micro percent of what is actually possible by manipulating the DNA. So yeah, that's a pretty astonishing thing to consider. And, and this reality, which we now have our hands on, harkens, I think, to the idea of the archetype, that there is a specific matrix that commands what will come forth from it and that the matrix is in some ways invisible. I think in the ancient world, it was amazing that an acorn could fall off of an oak tree and you plant it and another oak tree comes out of an acorn. So we observed this process that something was secretly hidden in a thing that would then blossom and somehow command the reappearance of, of a knowable object. So now that we have enough scientific understanding around the genetics and the genome, we might, we might venture a guess that that was also the intuitive, or that was intuitively predicted by ancient folks when they talked about these patterns, these eternal patterns that seem to reproduce the world. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, I wanna go back to the notion of uh, teams, or we didn't specifically say teams, but these Marvel movies and the pantheon of gods, they tend to be, uh, you can think of them as, as, as a team in each, God on the team has a role and a way of interacting in the world. And so you've got like the, the, the goofy guy. Um, I, I don't know all the Marvel characters, but I'll, I'll bet you that there's one character that's like the goofy guy, but the goofy <laughs> guy plays a role on the team. And then you've got the, the, the innocent, you know, lad or, or, or girl in, in the uh, Marvel movies that m might be the, the Spider-Man boy is, you know, young and impressionable, and, but he plays a role on the team. And then you've got the wise person who's been around and seen it all. And, and that person has a role on the team. Uh, do, is, do you have any thoughts about how the archetypes interact with one another in a team environment? Well, I think that we would need to do what Jung did, which is to go back to the ancient myths and even religions that have survived and be able to see the repetition of patterns that then continue. So again, if we want to have fun, we could look at, for instance, Iron Man, I think is an interesting modern um, kind of derivation of Hephaestus. 
And Hephaestus was the blacksmith of the gods. He was the metal worker. He himself was flawed and often humiliated, but he also created the thunderbolts for Zeus. And then we have the character of Iron Man who uses his command of technology and particularly metallurgy to create this outfit that grants him supernatural powers. Now, that I think is an incredibly relevant archetype to the entire industry of war. This ability to command the natural resources and turn them into weapons that serve higher powers around them, that, that we're seeing that happen. Another thing that we might imagine is that the Hulk in some ways represents Prometheus. And Prometheus was a Titan. He was a pre-Olympian monstrous and amazing being. And the Titans went to war with the Olympians. Prometheus steals fire from the gods and gives it to humanity and is punished by the gods by having his liver eaten out every day and at night it grows back. And so when we think about Steve Banner mucking around in this world of nuclear fission, there's a way in which he has kind of stolen fire from the gods. He's found a secret that we don't know whether or not humanity should have access to it. And because he has found this secret, in a way he's been punished by having to suffer this transformation into this monstrous titanic being that is overwhelming. Another way that we could even think of archetypes being really relevant, and I think this is very important uh, based on the military folks that I see in my clinical practice, is the archetype of Dionysus. Dionysus is the god of ecstasy and dismemberment and rebirth. And he's polarized by his brother Apollo, who's the god of order and beauty and medicine and music. And the two of them have this historic mythologic tension between them. So we take young men and we thrust them into a world that hyper-regulates every aspect of their environment. There's a way to do your hair and your clothes and fold your underwear, and there's a way to walk and shake hands and what part of the face you should look at when you're meeting somebody. It's a lot of curated information. And then we put them into these various roles. We insert them into roles in the military that are incredibly meticulously conscribed. And that, that also makes the, the unit work well. What's not allowed in that space explicitly is the irrational search for transcendence. Where this has been permitted, interestingly enough, is that of all the of all the various things that are prohibited if you are enlisted, alcohol is still permitted. And Dionysus is the god of wine. So when the Apollonic tension of being perfect and prescribed becomes too much, the fellows will then go into the world of alcohol to deconstruct the order and give themselves an opportunity to be wild and irrational and ecstatic. The difficulty around Dionysus as an archetype is that if somebody is possessed by the archetype, they are at risk for embodying the theme to its extreme. And we call that archetypal possession. So it's one thing to you know, drink a bit on a Saturday night and hoot and holler and, you know, have a good time and do some chest beating. It's another to drink to the point where your body is destroyed. You're beginning to become arrest, you're arrested by the military police or your life is kind of being deconstructed around you. That's also part of the archetype of Dionysus, but it's sobering. Mm 
So we're living in these tensions, for instance, between Apollo and Dionysus, just in the military. And we see it all the time in private practice, that tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, when you're describing that, I almost think of it as like a, like a process. It, oh, okay, well, first, let me back up. So I, it, it, it would make sense to me that uh, individuals may resonate with a, a dominant archetype, um, but all of the archetypes reside in each of us. And to a certain degree, all the archetypes have to be fed and nurtured and, um, and live through us, even if we do have like, you know, well, our go-to ar archetype is, is, is one or two of them, but it's, um, it's almost like, like, um, if, if an archetype is ignored too much or suppressed, then, uh, it will only stand for that so long before it reemerges um, and you know gets gets its moment uh, on the stage, so to speak, uh, and that could be you know very unhealthy. Um, so uh, I was just thinking about that when you were talking about uh, Dionysus and, and drinking and and how that can be a uh, unhealthy manifestation of that archetype if it is otherwise. Uh, suppressed. Do you, do you think that there's something to all of that? I, I think that what I would offer is a, a little uh, refinement on what you had said that mm -hmm. the archetypes cannot be lived out in their fullness in any one human being, that it would probably tear somebody apart, mm. that these forces, these psychological forces are so potent when they're activated that if one were to have three or four of these archetypal activations occur simultaneously, it would probably create an enormous a tearing apart of the psyche. So what we often find is that individuals tend to have a predisposition towards one archetype over the course of a lifetime. And maybe sometime around midlife, there could be a shift of archetype. And that's often creates radical changes in the personality. Now, the uh, hero's a, journey again, like a, a, a transformation. You're not the same person as you were when you were, you know, but before your, your, uh, before your journey. And let's talk about a ubiquitous example, perhaps from your own life that in the beginning of your life, you're, you're, you're a youth, you're a soldier, you have the kind of dynamism. And what woke up in you when your first child was born? Which to me, the archetype of the father. And how certain aspects of your personality were brought forward and became dominant to embody the archetype of the father and other qualities of your personality receded, which were not congruent with the archetype of the father. And that reshaped you radically and the same thing for your wife with the birth of the first child the archetype of the mother inhabits her body her mind her emotions and it reconfigures her values and priorities and these things are universal enough to be recognized now that kind of journey into the father and the mother i think is ubiquitous because having children is universal and and we need a kind of ancient wisdom to help us out in that process. More subtle archetypal dynamics, I think group people. So for instance, I would venture a guess that the archetype of the warrior is probably inherent in most people that are attracted by choice to go into various aspects of military service that it, it's simply explicit in the role. Now, when we had the draft so many years ago, I think it was difficult because the government was pulling people of all different type types into a military environment, into a war environment. And many people who were not archetypally congruent with that suffered greatly and were at great odds with it. 
I think that also made the military a much more difficult organization to manage. Now that we have a volunteer military, I think there's a much greater congruence that it calls people who already have some feeling for the energy of the warrior. Yeah. Um, does, does Jung have anything to say about societies and cultures and ways that an archetype or, or, or archetypes inhabit, inhabit like multiple people? Is, is there anything along those lines? I think that he's most expressive in that around that question when he is trying to understand how Germany became possessed by the Nazi ideology mm. in ways that uh, reshaped the culture. It, it, it's hard for us to understand how a neighbor who had known you for 30 years or maybe several generations suddenly gets swept up into an attitude where that same neighbor is calling up the SS to report you as being Jewish. What could cause such a radical, horrifying shift of values and attitudes? And so Jung wrote differently about that process as his own understanding or his own theorizing evolved. Two things seemed to play an important role. One was his analysis or attempt to understand who Hitler was as a human being. Mm -hmm. And he coined this term called the mana personality. And mana, of course, is this divine mythologic substance that fell from the heavens and fed the Israelites. Oh, okay. In yeah. Diaspora. Yeah. Out of from heaven. Yeah. But what he was trying to express is that some people seem to have an ability to tap into the collective unconscious and become, become a, the mouthpiece of the collective archetype that is pressing on that group of people. So for instance, coming back to the whole rise of Nazi power, is that Jung felt that a pre-Christian archetype, Wotan, who was a god of war and the god of wind, had somehow become active in the collective psyche of the German people. And while that was pressing on any number of people, he was theorizing, that Hitler had a certain kind of mediumistic personality so that when he was dropping down into himself, he became the mouthpiece of the kinds of language, ideas, orientation that were congruent with this, again, pre-Christian image of the war god. And that as Jung analyzed the various initiatives that Hitler was putting into place and his, um, the people around him, there was, in fact, a movement away from modern religion and back to a kind of early Germanic paganism. There was a movement towards a tribalism. There was a movement towards the annihilation of the stranger all of which were part of this ancient archetypal stratosphere. Some of the individuals that were surrounding Hitler apparently were also well-read in mythology and in the use of symbols. So the way that they co-opted some archetypal symbolism and wrapped their mission around those images also potentiated its effect on the collective. So Jung, at first, and he was interviewed by a magazine, an American magazine, and he was talking about Mussolini and Hitler. And he had a very um, 
cavalier tone about it. He basically said, Jung, Jung, Jung did? Jung did in the beginning. Uh -huh. He said, you know, just keep your head down. Keep doing what you're doing in your lives. And all this is going to blow over. This must have been maybe in the 1930s. Exactly. Late, late 30s. Okay. Um, and he felt very confident about that. You know, he, he named what was happening, but wasn't particularly alarmed. And then even as the German culture and the German government was being reconfigured, Jung still took a kind of academic curiosity about it, which he was criticized for. Although I don't know whether that's fair because Jung wasn't a prophet. He was just a scientist and a philosopher. And then it wasn't until things became far more horrible that Jung took a much more active analytic stance. He did reach out to Freud and actually tried to help him escape from Europe, offered to help him do that, hmm. as well as other ways that he tried to intervene as much as he could. But it was after the horrors began to emerge that Jung really became desperately interested in trying to diagnose how this thing happens. In one way, so that these insights could act as a vaccination against it occurring again, but also helping people survive the chaos, which in part was brought forward by the lack of understanding around what was occurring. So this idea of being a mana personality, being able to hear what's rising in the collective, give voice to it and hear the collective approve of what we've said. And this echoing back and forth from the collective to the leader and back into the collective creates a kind of rising of archetypal dynamics that can sweep enormous groups of people into mm. behaviors that they would not normally accept from themselves. Mm. So that you're you're describing that, that I, it give me a little just a little rope here, but uh, it's almost like uh, each archetype has competencies that are associated with it, or you know superpowers, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're you're describing like a superpower that's associated with this mana archetype, which is somehow able to connect with the zeitgeist or something to connect with the here and now and 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 absorb it feed it back and reabsorb it and feed it back in a way and and that's that's how you're describing like hitler's engagement does that sound about right i think so i think that the archetype pre-exists hmm for reasons that Jung could not explain, and maybe no one can, that the archetype constellated in the collective psyche of the German people, again, Jung's theory. He also felt that the German culture had been so damaged by World War I, economically, socially, they had been really crushed and torn apart. Mm -hmm. And so there was a choice you know, as to whether or not there's going to be a kind of German diaspora, where there's going to be an abandoning of the historic culture and integration into the um, nation states around them, perhaps. But because the culture itself had an ancient historic taproot and its own mythology, that the archetype initially rises to offer meaning and structure to counteract the chaos. And Jung said this is one of the values of archetypes. And he was very ambivalent about archetypes because he'd seen that archetypes do a lot of damage. That when we are in a state of chaos, either collectively or individually, something in the human spirit is reaching for an ordering principle What's difficult is that ordering principle can look like a lot of different things. And the ordering principle of Wotan, 
in that culture was a principle of war and domination and violence as all the gods of war bring forward. Hmm. So you're, you're saying that uh, the current conditions are ripe for certain kinds of manifestations or uh, things, things, things emerge out of the current soup that are only able to emerge when those certain conditions are just so. I, I'm reminded of this, um, oh, I don't know, metaphor or something where um, uh, something like all of the sea you know, in the earth, like below my feet right now in the earth there are all kinds of seeds um but but those seeds are not going to sprout until the external conditions are just so and then they they will start growing uh it's it's almost like that so like if if you wanted to create a, a certain set of circumstances um ah, i'm not quite sure where i'm going with it it's, i'm i'm struggling but this i mean this is deep stuff let me offer something which I think you're leaning into intuitively is there is a, an aspect of quantum physics that is interested in a phenomena called contextual parameters, which I have found personally fascinating relative to the same question about archetypes. The idea of discovering and manipulating contextual parameters has crept into all kinds of environments. So in a nutshell, the theory is that if there are a certain set of conditions that are highly specific, that it will compel phenomena. So if we take a, 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 a simplified example, and it, God knows I'm not a physicist, but let's just say we took the phenomena of snow and we were curious about it. We could, we could approach this in a lot of different ways. We could take some water, we could do this today and freeze it. And then we would take maybe a grater, we kind of grate it and maybe it looks kind of white and a little fluffy and we throw it in the air and we say, well, this is snow. But actually, if you were to examine those little flecks of ice that we've thrown in the air, they actually don't have the elegance of actual snow. So another way of doing that is to step back and let's create an imaginal snowflake box. So it's a kind of box, it's a rarefied environment and maybe one dial deals with temperature, the other with wind velocity, the other with uh, humidity. And then we set the dials and then we provide some energy and then we open the box and it looks like slush. So we emptied that out and we play around with the dials again, and maybe we make it a little colder, we make the wind a little faster, then all of a sudden snow happens in the box. So there are conditions that compel snow to happen. There's a rather radical idea can come out of that, that snow could conceivably happen anywhere where those conditions manifest. It could snow in your mouth, if every condition in the box were capable of happening in your mouth, you might snow in your mouth or in your bathroom or on another planet. One step above that, which I think is where I go archetypally is, we could then infer that the quality of snowflakeness or the archetypal idea of snow is omnipresent in all places at all times, simply waiting for the conditions of snow to compel the phenomena, which is what you were talking about as mm. seeds in this mythic earth that are just waiting for certain conditions. Yeah. This idea of contextual parameters is used in the stock market all the time. Stock market analysts are looking for the levers that compel certain things to occur in terms of predicting movements in stocks. People who manage highway systems are looking at this exact same phenomena. Uh, 
what are the basket of conditions that always compel um, traffic problems? And then how can we adjust the dials so that doesn't happen? By extension, right. yeah. my curiosity then goes, I don't know, what are the, what are the conditions that cause um, cancer in the body or what are the contextual parameters that cause alcoholism or the archetype of alcoholism to manifest in someone's psyche? And I think this is a really an incredible inquiry, which not a lot has been done with in the Jungian world in terms of what conditions cause an archetype to constellate. What are the parameters around that? But I feel that most of the research around that is being done in the field of marketing. Right, right. Well, this gets circles back to my original research question, I guess. And I, frankly, I, I don't know what is being done in this research space, but I would suggest to our audience that it is uh, some, you know, there, there's some interesting questions that can be asked. And, and I think there's data available today that can, that can help answer those types of questions. And um, I, I do know that it is a, a live requirement uh, to to get better and better and better at understanding what has happened, what is happening, and being able to pre predict what is likely to happen next, and to also be able to somehow catalog all of that, uh, all those models in ways that, as you were talking, Joseph, you know, looking at look at it from all kinds of different contexts and slice and dice so that when when these kinds of activities are happening simultaneously then we can expect snow in the mouth <laughs> to, <laughs> to to emerge we know that when we see this and this and this surprisingly enough it will snow in your mouth um but yeah those those types of things are uh, very much uh, on on the docket of things that are being researched. And um, I was not expecting quantum to come up in today's conversation, but um, we actually had a pretty cool conversation with a gentleman, um, uh, Paul Lapata, uh, on quantum related stuff. I'd refer our audience back to check that one out too. Um, I, I'd like to wrap up, if, if I may, Joseph, um, coming back to Joseph Campbell. Uh, one of the things that he said that really grabbed me was um well so so he 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 was a scholar from the 50s 60s 70s and i think he died in the late 80s maybe the very early 90s but uh you know he so th this was something that he said uh, again on that power of myth um uh video series um you know he, he was recognizing that there has been a decline in religion or in, in people who identify as religious and attendance at religious uh, services uh, in the West. But I think it's something that can be, you know, a, a lot of people can probably just intuitively agree with. Uh, but he, he was saying that, you know, the stories that religions tell their parishioners are not to be taken literally, they're, they're metaphorical, but really what we need today is our own myth. We need our own story that resonates, you know, kind of like the Star Wars story. I'm not saying that we should adopt the Star Wars story as, as, our, as our myth, but something needs to emerge today which helps galvanize societies or uh i'm 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 partial to the united states and the west but something that needs to kind of needs to cohere over this chaos that that i think we're all uh experiencing um what kind of what kind of thoughts do you have in response to that notion you know i, I i'm i'm wildly speculating right now and i and i don't want to speak for of course of course, our yeah. field of Jungian inquiry. Yeah, I think one of the things we're experiencing in the United States is the is a kind of birth pain that 
because the United States is not an ancient culture, and the millions of people who live in the United States now don't have a common cultural experience per se, not ancestrally, that there is a struggle for people to find a taproot into something that is deep enough, mythologic enough to organize the disparity of characters that are part of the American scene. So there was an early effort, I think, to turn the founding fathers into mythologic figures. But that hasn't really taken root. Like if you've gone to the US Capitol and you look up in the dome, there's a picture of George Washington in the clouds. I think they call it the apotheosis of Washington, where Washington has become a kind of mythic figure, a, a kind of godlike figure looking down from heaven. But the American public really didn't buy into that, not in a way that really seemed to work. For a while, there was an effort to turn Thomas Jefferson or James Madison or any other of the founding fathers into mythic figures. That doesn't seem to work either. Probably in some ways, because we have so much historical record around their humanity that they haven't been boiled down into mythic figures. And if you notice, most mythic figures that we refer to like Zeus, you know, there's a bucket full of myths. Um, and they're all pretty bare bones. You, know, you read Ovid's Metamorphosis to get a sense of the Roman mythology. There's not an awful lot of detail, but there is a structure around it. And there's a structure that people can kind of feel, but also their imaginations can layer all kinds of details into it that are relevant to their own psyche. When we have a lot of biological and historic information about individuals, it's very hard for us to layer the kind of fantasy material onto them that would turn them into religious figures. So I think that the founding fathers can't create or can't act as mythic figures for us. I think that Christianity has tried to provide a mythic frame, no offense to people who practice Christianity as a heartfelt religion, mm -hmm. but if we think about it the way um, Joseph Campbell talked about it, that it's, it's a mythos, it's a, it's a story, that the myth of the Redeemer and the Messiah harkens back to Zoroastrianism, which is part of this ancient Persian world, which probably influenced both Judaism and then uh, Islam and, and uh, eventually Christianity. But the archetype of the Messiah seems to have lost its way in a particularly American culture. And I think across Europe that uh, cathedrals and churches are being abandoned um, and no longer attended all across Europe. And these abandoned buildings are now become a, like a, a question for the local municipalities. I attribute a couple of things to that movement. And one has to do with the shift from Catholicism to Protestantism that when we moved as a culture to Protestantism, there was a purging of art and image out of Christianity. And image is one of the primary ways that the human psyche comes in contact with archetype. The mm. unimaged forces don't have a staying power. So when the early Protestant churches were bare with nothing more than maybe a wooden crucifix, all of the connection to the archetype had to be generated by the populace. And if the populace was punished, and they were, for trying to add various kinds of imagistic additions to the religion, by suppressing that, it actually alienates people from the archetype itself. And this is why when we have attempted to 
enliven the imagery, it has such an impact on the population. I think back in the 70s, I think it was, where they did a movie about uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and then recently, The Passion of Christ, which were these very thoughtful staging of the mythos, that, that these movies were wildly popular. I mean, wildly popular, that people who were attending The Passion of Christ had a kind of religious fervor around the movie. And that speaks to the thirst and the hunger to have cultural images that a society can agree upon that embody the mythos. So we're, we're in a difficult position because of certain fateful decisions that happened in our culture. But coming back to your question of, is there a new myth that's emerging? And Jung said, I'm trying to think if this was a letter or an encounter. So a guy named Max Zeller uh, came to Jung and was, um, I believe it was an analysis with Jung, and he brought him a dream. And he said that there were people from all over the world who had come together, including Max himself, and they were brick by brick building an enormous temple of some kind. And it had this overwhelming feeling for Max. And he shared it with Jung and Jung said, oh yeah, yeah, I hear that dream all the time. <laughs> a very kind of matter of fact way that Max had had this dream of the building of a temple. And Jung said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the new religion that humanity is building but it's going to take several hundred years before it emerges. That is some thought provoking stuff and life is emerging constantly and in ways that we may not understand for a long time. And with that, Joseph Lee, thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.